What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Mommy Needs a Break. It's a podcast for new moms who don't have it together because we ain't got it together and we need a break. You guys, this is a very special episode. I'm Megan Thomas, one of your hosts at Make Scoop Everywhere. I'm Marisa Johnson at She Is Marisa J. Don't forget to follow our podcast at MNAB Podcast. Um, also, visit our website, right, Marisa? I'm sorry. Do you? <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I'm like, I'm done. Yes, you can follow our website at www.mnabpodcast.com. <laughs> yes, and you can. Because, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say because I'm so proud of our website because you did that. Like, it looks so pretty. Thank you. Thank you. I Look tried. I tried. Uh, make sure to subscribe to our Patreon as well. Uh, we upload our uh, interviews right after we complete them and you will get them first and then they will air to the public two weeks later. So make sure to subscribe. Support oh, us. not just that. It's like the raw, unedited, uncut. Oh yeah. You see all my mess ups, and my mm-hmm. spacing out, all that. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I got Bobby guys, Brown. Um, we, you know, our show's going to be a little bit different today. Um, we usually have like mommy tips and uh, ain't no shames for parenting and all that kind of stuff. But today is going to be different because, you know, it's been on, on me and Maurice's heart to, to talk about what's going on in the world. And I feel like as black mothers, like, how could we not? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so today our guest is beautiful. She's a wife. She's a mother. She used to be in a singing group. <laughs> that I really liked back in the day. Um, she is the president of the National Basketball. Yeah, excuse me. She's the president of the National Basketball Wives Association. You guys give it up for Mia Wright. Hello, guys. Thank you for joining us. By the way, it's a big finally moment. And yes. should we just go ahead and get into the backstory of this? Y'all, yes. Moment? No. We we nobody. Talk about, okay. Talk about talk about how long this has been of us trying to get Mia on this show and tell. What happened, Marisa? Why okay. did we not get Mia on here before? What month was that? How many months ago was that? That was like January. Yeah, no, before January. <laughs> no, that, that was, was way before like January. Last year. Yeah, that was like, wait, 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 I was like five months to... pregnant. I was like five okay. months pregnant. Yeah. yeah, it's when we first started shooting with. Oh, with well, that pregnant. was like September. Then. Yeah, that was like September, it was a long October. time ago. Okay. And neither but, here oh. nor there. So <laughs> me, <laughs> me and I go to the same hairstylist. Damien, you can find him on, what is he on, Sloss? No, he's not on Sloss. I don't know where Damien is. Jefferson. But yes, he, Jefferson. Salter Beauty, at D Salter Beauty. We're go go find Sloss. him. He, he he does. Bomb. He is bomb. Yeah. However, hair. <laughs> I have been going to Damien for years. And the thing is, he has always brought you up to me. Like he's always, because I always encourage him to like, do things with his business and things like that. And he's always like, you sound like Mia, you sound like her. You guys should, you guys should talk. We'll do. So we've had conversations about you. Let me say that. Mm -hmm. One day I text him and I said, Hey, can I have Mia's number? I want her to be a guest on my podcast, my mommy podcast. And he was like, sure. Let me make sure it's okay. Cool. He sends me the information. So I call. No, I text. I said, hey, girl, like, do you mind uh, getting on a quick phone call? I want to do like the run a show with you. Whoop-dee, whoop-dee, whoop. Introduce myself. Mm-hmm. Sure. Give me a call. I call her. I call Mia. I call Mia. OK. And I t- I'm from the Bay Area. Right. Had season tickets all my life. Whatever. Um, I, I go in and I'm like, yeah, like I ran into you a few times at the games. You, uh, you were so nice to my little cousin. You sent him, uh, an autograph from Darrell back in the day. I started talking about Kehlani and how, like when I was managing her, like we would look at you and be like, oh, she's beautiful. She's like, she's sporty. She's cool. Like all these things that like, right. You would think in your head, somebody would be like, okay, whatever. Yeah. All right. So I'm going on how like I, I, I've loved you. I've, I've, I've watched like what you've been doing with organization, how you speak out. Whoop, and she's like, I love it. Whoop de woo. You know, um, I'm from L.A. So she said I'm from L.A., right? This person on the phone. And so I, I knew I was talking to you. She was agreeing. She was like, oh, thank you. She was. I can't <laughs> believe, you know, all this stuff about me, you know, whatever. So. We get to the day of, of shooting. Mind you, we had 10, I think we had 10 episodes we were shooting that day, something crazy. Yeah, and they, something, were, it was they like, were scheduled. It was like five or, yeah, it was like yeah, back to we back. were scheduled back to back to back. So it's Mia's slot 
and my doorbell rings and I'm, you know, Mia. And so I open the door and it, it, I know who she is because she is Damien's um, cousin who does braids at the salon. And I'm like, and I'm thinking in my head, literally I'm thinking this in my head, oh, Mia brought someone to do her hair. And in my head, I'm thinking we ain't got time for that, but hey, to each his <laughs> own, like, do you? I, I'm not gonna, <laughs> whatever. So I'm like, oh, where's Mia? And she was, and I'm looking out the door and she was like, I'm Maya. I don't know why you kept calling me Mia. Oh Lord. <laughs> Your heart. Yo. I'll take with Maya right now because I need some braids. <laughs> but so when okay, so then cut to when Marissa finally hits me up, I'm like, okay, wait, time out. <laughs> How did you get me confused and scheduled? Like what happened? I was I was talking distinct like pinpoint things. First of all, if you look in the mirror and don't think you look like Kaylani, there's a red flag right there, right? Hello. Like I've been in that shop with Maya and she be doing them braids, girl. She is not, she's on that phone, but like she's there, but she's not, she's doing that with them braids. Like, mm, right and she's just like, this braiding moment. And she's just like, mm hmm. Because mm-hmm. I know Maya. It, she's so sweet. it was the most awkward. And Megan was over there trying to like, I was just, I'm doing what I'm doing right now. I was just cracking. Trying to interview her. Up. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to, I was just like, no, I was talk, I thought it was the most hilarious thing. Cause I'm sitting here like, I know all the stuff that Marisa did to, to right. like get you confirmed Mia. Right. She said everything that was specifically about you. And this girl on the phone was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I was like, girl, call your hairdresser. How did he get Mia and his cousin Maya mixed up? It was so funny. And then, so at that juncture, I'm like, okay, I was just so confused about the whole thing. And then we finally like met up like at Simply Wholesome and like walked through the store and I'm like, okay, makes sense. Like, yes, I do want to do the podcast. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are, y'all. It was a lot. I'm sorry, Maya. I'm really sorry. She she had her hair done. She had makeup. I, I, yeah, I, felt, I felt really so bad. bad. I, was just like, I felt Dang. really bad. She, came, felt, she like Ubered all the way over to your house. <laughs> to oh, and we had another person coming. So it was like, <sighs> are you thirsty? Like, oh, hungry? It was so bad. Okay. It was so bad. Yeah. <sighs> But we got so you. finally, we say all that to say we have finally, you know, I feel like God works in mysterious ways because that like we had this whole scheduled mm-hmm. out interview for you. But I feel like the time that we're going through right now in the community, we need you for this episode and not the one that we had planned for you like, you know, last year. Mm-hmm. So so let's talk about that, you know, because it's been a, a rough few weeks I mean it's been a rough 400 years let's be honest but the last few weeks have been a doozy for us as black moms um people who live in black communities who are affected by everything that we see in the media on the news everything Mm -hmm. um so just talk to me really quick about you know you and your family your husband is uh Darrell Wright who who plays for the the Warriors right he did did. oh he did he played for the Warriors okay supposedly retired we'll see (laughs) Girl, we understand. Right. Um, and, and you guys have two two beautiful sons. Um, you said 12 and 5? 12 and 5, yeah. Devin and Dash. Mm-hmm. How do you balance all of that, you know, being in the limelight, raising two sons in this current environment, you know, and being so much so where, like, you almost have to be careful what you say, but then again, you are an enraged Black mom. Like, what do you do? Right. And there's, I hear, nope, I'm, a, I'm on the interview. There's, Dash there's is so cute. Right now. Wait, you gotta ask daddy, whatever you need, ask daddy. <laughs> it's mommy time. Mommy. Um, well, first I want to, I want to say this because your audience may or may not know me or where I come from. I grew up in Ladera Heights, Inglewood, View Park, the trifecta, like between that area, mm-hmm. went to a parent, you know, K through A. And I just want to first address something that we don't really like to talk about within our community, which is if you're like, I'm multiracial, I'm Creole, I'm Italian, I'm Chilean, right? Um, Even though I grew up with my predominantly Black family and neighborhood and like, that is what I am. And that's what comes through me. I, we don't talk about colorism and color bias and feature bias, which is very real. I think all of us on this chat can attest to that. And I think growing up, um, 
for me, it was, I got the opposite because I was the light skin with the long hair. I had mm-hmm. to like toughen up, you know what I mean? And I had to kind of tomboy up just so that I didn't feel threatening or, um, I don't know. I just, I never liked that preconceived notion of who you think I am because of the way that I look right Mm -hmm. within our community. That's the first thing I have to recognize my bias, whether I use that to my advantage or not. Like I have to be very sensitive to the things that I say because I don't relate to the walk. Mm. My husband does my children may. um, But I just wanted to put that out there and like, Mm. let's start there. Recognize that. I cannot even believe what's going on. I want to grab a pill. <laughs> that's, that's our ain't no shame. <laughs> Where are the adults? Dad? <laughs> Go in the garage immediately. This is crazy. Sorry about that, guys. Black it's okay. Mama, oh, All the way out. It's okay. <laughs> um, but so, and then the second, you know, thing, yes, I grew up in inner city LA. Definitely, um, Grew up with six O's and, you know, the gangbang lifestyle. And um, it's you, then you always get that conversation too. Like when we're confronted as a nation with racism and systemic racism, that's the first thing that jumps out. Well, black people kill each other. And it's like, okay, at this point, we really, especially the white community, has to recognize. A, their privilege, and B, what systemic racism is, what redlining is. When we see this police, this budget that LA just released, stuff that we may not pay attention to, why is so much money going to the police force? Like, why is this funding not going to our public schools? We don't give, our kids aren't given A, a head start, or B, even opportunity and resources. That's stuff that we have to literally beat against all odds to end up in these prominent places and situations. Um, and you know, because I feel safe and because I represent black culture, but in this, you know, I live in the suburbs, you know what I mean? We're one of very few black families in our neighborhood and I've had to be, and you'll see on my social media, very confrontational, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, no, 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 no. I don't, yeah. I don't feel any way about your discomfort right now. Like you need to be aware, especially your sons are calling my son a best friend. Like, yeah, but here's what's really going on. And y'all need to recognize this. Like, I love that it's so confrontational right now because that is uncomfortable or being uncomfortable is where you at least create awareness with, you know, the hope to create change. So, yeah. I had a quote. Oh, go ahead. I wanted to comment on that because I feel like, you know, I feel like, you know, my reason I talked about this, that so for so many years, we've had to be, uh, we've had to cater to white feelings and like, and like I'm from the South, I grew up in the South. So it's like, it's this part of your lifestyle that you, you know, even so far, I had to have a conversation with my father years ago. He would call everyone white, Mr. And Mrs., even if they were younger than him. And I said, dad, you got to stop doing that. He's a 70 year old black man from the South. And he's still like, he didn't even recognize that when his, his boss was coming, his, 30 year old boss would come and come over and say something to him. He'd be like, all right, Mr. Bob. And I was like, stop calling him. He need to call you, Mr. Thomas. Right. You, don't, you don't need to be calling him Mr. Bob. And he just didn't even realize how ingrained in our people it is to, you know, respect white people, treat them nice, talk to them a different way. And, yeah. and like, it's uncomfortable for a lot of white people because they've never had to have this conversation. This is new territory for them. If they, if they weren't around in the sixties, you know, this is different for them. And so it's like, well, I can't believe you guys felt like this this whole time. Yes, we did. But unfortunately for us, we were taught, we were, it's been ingrained into our people to cater to your feelings, make sure you feel safe and not threatened by the color of my skin or, you know, how I talk to you. So now everybody tired. I'm tired of putting this mask on. (laughs) I'm tired. tired. The mask is off. This is how I'm going to talk to you because this is the truth. To the credit of our people and our ancestors, that was a survival mechanism. You know what I mean? And even though we would move through these periods of times, there was always something like every five years to decade, something that was put on public display that showed you are still not regarded as 
a American citizen, period. Or yeah. regarded as a second class American citizen. Yeah. You're right. still not guaranteed what we promised on contract, which America is a land of laws and in order, right? So to this day, we still are not being um, guaranteed our civil liberties and our civil rights. It's crazy to say that in 2020, yeah. but it's very yeah. true. It's yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel um, that you're, I kind of feel like I know this answer. <laughs> Do you take extra precautions when you're posting anything about these type of issues? Because you and your husband both are public figures. You guys associate with a, a lot of different people in the media. Do you you know, type things and then, you know, delete it, <laughs> you know, do you ever feel that pressure that you have to say things a certain way? Um, being PC, being politically correct. Yeah. Well, now that I'm in the position as president and director of MBWA, um, which is a nonprofit and which is representative of NBA wives and significant others, um, even though my membership and my girls, like they know me and they know me personally. I still have to be um, cognizant of the outside and, Mm -hmm. you know, the partnerships that we're looking for to help us fund these initiatives. Um, I do have to uh, have to be aware of that. Recently though, (laughs) with all this start (laughs) going down, I put on my all of my personal social media um, channels that, you know, the views that I express are my own because mm-hmm. I, like everyone else, you just, you get to a point of being like, this is bullshit. And yeah. the money that is made, the, the celebration of our culture, the appropriation of our culture is not changing what's happening in the streets. And until the people that have the ability to speak up and to, you know, at least again, cause awareness of what's happening until we own that responsibility and really start um, using and leveraging our platform and our voice for things other than our personal brands, this is gonna continue to happen. And so, like I said, I mean, you could go check out my social (laughs) media right now and I'm leaving it up there. Um, I said what I said and I mean what I mean. And I think that as a Black community, we have a really, um, this is a pivotal moment for us. And there is a huge responsibility um, for even people, not in just the sports and entertainment space, but in the finance space, in, you know, the agricultural space. Like, we got to come together on some meeting of the minds, what's really good, how do we create systemic change, right? And I need to do some more research because deep politics is not really my thing, but I think it was Dr. There's a video that a friend shared and Dr. Claude Anderson, I can't even tell you what that brother does, but he has a video that I just recently watched where he made some really interesting points that, you know, America is all about politics and our votes are great for the Democratic Party, but they're not great for us. Nothing yeah. comes of it. Nothing comes of it. And so we have to now organize and say, he said, pull our registrations as Democrats, create the Black Independent Party, say to these politicians, we got 43 million votes. We have a voting block. Mm. What are you going to do? What are your policies? You know what mm. I mean? Like, and I think that's what Diddy was alluding to when he said the Black vote's not for free. And our people love to chop down and we don't understand what he's talking yeah. about. Like, in, yeah. you know, we like to pick apart and, and instead of researching and really trying to figure out what the message is. But I think that's what he's alluding to, you know, yeah. and, and maybe it is that we need a new agenda. The new agenda is not us trying to take over the Democratic Party. Let's create our own party and yeah. let's use let's leverage the numbers and let's start to build hmm. our economy and really let's move some wealth into black owned banks. You know, I'm like we have to start building up community in a co- in economy in a way that we, I don't think we've ever done before. If we did, it was completely demolished, you know. Right. Yeah, Tulsa for sure. Right. Like, places like that. You know, I, it's interesting that you say that because I, I think, you know, anytime we as black people in, in this country in particular have ever tried to do something like that, it almost felt like, you know, white people are threatened. And so then they take it from us and then we we get so discouraged, we're now back to zero. 
um, I feel like there's not, not as many communities that have done exactly what you're talking about, but we're in the perfect place. We've got black wealth. Okay. We actually have a lot of money when you think about it, especially when you look at the top 5% of wealth from African-Americans, we got enough money to fund all of the stuff from our 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 entertainers to business owners. We actually have enough wealth in the black community to do exactly what you're saying. Now the question is how do we mobilize to make sure we do that? Exactly that. Like we need to, I think it's becoming more apparent to people in this global world where our kids are friends with every nation Mm -hmm. at school how do we tell them? How do we teach them? Hey, even though your friends are every color, you still need to make sure you have your own identity as a black man, as a black woman and support black. How do we teach our kids that in this global society? Mm -hmm. That's a, I think the million dollar question. And it first starts with education. Um, I was speaking with, I had a little, some inflammatory words on next door. Do you guys know that app? (laughs) Oh man, I'd be on there. Uh, (laughs) usually stay off because I love my home and I do love my community, <laughs> but this is, these are not my people. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm not on there because I don't want to not like everybody. Um, but I have to just go tiptoe on there to see what they were talking about. Mm-hmm. And um, women of black moms reached out like, hey, I saw your post on next door. Like, this literally sounds like my neighbors to me. Yeah, yeah like, can we get together? <laughs> And what do I, you know, aside from donating, what can we do? And I said, you know, what would be really interesting is if we have like a town hall and I've talked about this with my community, but other lead into other bigger things. Um, But educating our children um, on the real history of Africans, not black people, not African-Americans, but our real lineage in heritage because we're so disconnected from that. Yeah. Like when you think about the immigrants that came over here and thrived, they still, they will go back home. They had textiles. They had uncles that had the, you know, the wholesale stuff and they're coming back and they're creating these, um, these flourishing businesses. And because of the system of slavery and, 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 pulling different tribes together and and making sure that the languages were broken and and families were broken and, you know, just all the, the horrid, the horrible stuff that happened and why success, why slavery was successful. We were completely disconnected from our roots and our heritage. So all our kids know in the beginning of history books is slavery, which is a lie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think when you educate and really empower your child to, to feel um, to feel um, empowered by what is their true lineage and heritage and history. That's a starting point because then again, it's an awareness like, oh, so we had, so we were the Moors. Okay, so we gave Spain, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you start to feel powerful, right? And you start to feel like you have some footing to do something differently. And um again, education, and then really educating our kids on how to play the game in America. Like, Mm -hmm. we don't, unless you're going to college, which a lot of us aren't, and you are, even if we are, I don't, I don't know a great deal of people that study political science, or, you know, are looking to, to go into politics as a, a career, but understanding how to play the game, understanding uh, what it is to create a business and what it is to be on a board. You know what I mean? Like these are the mm. things that we should be talking to our kids about now. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. while they're young. Absolutely. That's so funny. Wow. You know, like you say all these things and I'm I'm like laughing because I'm thinking like, you are so right. And my son is only a year and a half and I really try to have this talk with him. I was like, look, you are a black king. And let me tell you what your rights are. I even ordered a book from uh, the, the activist in New York, my son, my son, I, I, I don't know how to say his name, but I think it's my son. And he wrote a book. It's like the Bill of Rights for Kids and it's for black children. And I ordered the book. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna read this to you, Bab. I know you don't understand anything right now because you're a year and a half, but you need to know you have rights, okay? You need to know what the law is pertaining to you should you ever get caught up in a situation where it's just you and the police, right? Yeah. You know, no matter what age you are. So I think it's really important. And as I was listening to you talk, I'm thinking like as parents, 
there's still so much work we have to do, you know, because I can't tell you where I'm from. I don't I barely even know like half of my side, you know, like half my mom's side. I don't even know them. You know what I mean? And and I think that's that's sad. One thing I saw Terrell doing last night, he, he called his mom and his brothers are scattered all over the place. Um, he's Creole too, and or his mom is. And um, he made a Facebook group for all his family members last night, just so they can start kind of, you know, sharing pictures and because they are spread out. I was in Damien's shop one time and a girl looked at me and asked me, was I married to him? And it was his cousin. I had no idea. Yeah. Right. And and it makes me sad. Like. It wasn't OK that my life was like that, but that doesn't mean their life has to be that way, too. You know, right. and so for us as parents, you know, doing the research and and really, you know, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, the men relationships and things like that. But it does start with your own family. Yeah. You know, and, and being a strong unit, you know, and knowing where you come from, you know, right. because a lot of us do feel abandoned at times, mm-hmm. you know, and, and like, I don't even know my first cousin. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, so it's a lot of work that we have to do, I feel like, as parents as well. Um, to educate ourselves and so that our our kids have it better than we did. Yep. Uh, uh, Mia, do you think that there is a responsibility for athletes and their families, uh, black athletes in particular, and their families to stand up in a time like this or, or be more vocal in a time like this? Um, I feel definitely... Um, there should be leaders. Like I said, not just in sports, entertainment, agriculture, finance, like we should have just the, you know, the leaders that are in the forefront that can speak to the black experience or, you know, speak on the culture in times like these, in times where people are looking to be educated and, and understanding, even though that's not our responsibility. Um, but that's been a, a great question. Where's the black leadership? Where's the leadership? Mm-hmm. You know, Jesse Jackson for so many years. It was Al Sharpton for so many yeah. years. We're going to touch on Uncle Jesse. <laughs> point that. Mark that. Uncle Jesse, we coming back to you. Um, so I feel like anybody that has a platform um, where you have children millions of people following you and, and listening to your voice. Um, it's not every person's, um, skill set, even though they could be an athlete and incredible talent, not every person can articulate what the messages that need to be heard. Right. Um, so for those that can, and, um, for those that care about, the empowerment and uh, progressive um, direction of the black community absolutely have a responsibility. Is it every athlete? No. Right. Um, is it every NBA wife or sports wife or, you know, no. Um, but I think again, now more than ever, because we're seeing, um, it's almost feels like a slap in the face every time something like this happens. And I think for so long, white culture was able to even try to separate black elites, you know, black Mm -hmm. wealth from, it became like a classist thing. And it it became like, you can't win unless you're playing within this realm. And like you said, now we have, you know, Oprah, Jay-Z, Kenneth Chenault, um, Robert Smith, like we have black billionaires that, and, and multimillionaires um, where we can have our own subset in culture, the Tyler Perry's who has his own studio. Like we really got to tap into um, our black wealth and, and our black elite, the puffs, um, and really demand and expect from them more than anything. Yeah. And, and let's, let's step, take a step back from feeling like we have to assimilate to mainstream culture or that's the only way that we can win. Cause that's where you get the sellout thing, right? Yeah. When you think about the owners, you know, in the NBA teams and Donald Sterling, I know uh, Chris Paul just executive directed something called blackballed about Donald oh, Sterling yeah. and, and the weird, you know, uncomfortable, just ridiculous situations that they had to be in. But there's that idea that at any given moment I could pull the rug 
and you're done. You know what I mean? I could, I could ruin your career, ruin your finances. And we have to step out of that fear-based thinking. Like we got to yeah. get out of that. Yeah. I think with, uh, we were talking, um, I think with that said, you know, now is the time to speak. And, and, and like, I've had a couple of conversations that are uncomfortable. They're still happening right now um, with white people. And I was trembling. And when I thought about it, it was because of like Megan said, you know, the training of the mind of like, we have to tiptoe. Oh, I have to say it a certain way. And one thing I I told my younger siblings, uh, they were like crying because of the day they had at work. And I said, if anything right now, I feel liberated. I feel like if I say something and someone has half of what they think they want to say to me, look, look what could happen. Right. People are out in the streets. Right. You're being exposed online. People's phone right. numbers, addresses mm-hmm. like you don't yeah. want to walk on those waters right now. And 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 they're listening. Right. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. if anything, even if we're not out there protesting, even if we're not out there, you know, risking our life, jumping in front of cops, like right. we can do them justice and, and speak up where it's uncomfortable, you know, yeah. because this is our time to be liberated. We are. We are. I felt liberated when I got off that phone. I was like, I've been holding this in for five years. Wow. And there is no reason why I should feel this heavy and you are going about your day like nothing is going on in this world. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, like you need to share some of this weight with me. And yeah. and I and I and I was talking, you know, if you ever go to like white churches, they're so light. They're so everything is so free and breezy. And it's because they don't carry this. They don't carry these Ooh. these questions and these these concerns and these fears that we have every day. And then we feel like we can't even say anything to them about it. Mm -hmm. And so now if anything, it's like, Oh, say what you say, what you (laughs) need to say, you know, because uh, if anything, Uh, Oh, say what you need to say. She woke up right, right when you were being empowered. She's like, Oh, I need to say my piece. piece. Um, but no, you know, it, it, this is the time. This is yeah. the time to not hold back. Anything. We're definitely in a disruptive moment. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I love the the fire that, that's been um, put, you know, under our community at every level. Um, mm-hmm. And I just, you know, I'm going to do my part to make sure that there is actionable items you know we have like the sean kings who started mm-hmm. grass uh grassroots, grassroots. Law. Mm-hmm. yeah um and, and with lee merritt and that's great and you know again everybody has a role and yeah. so um but there definitely needs to be some sort of like collective <laughs> like yeah. some sort of um just uh game plan you know what i mean like hey we got the attention so now it's the game plan but you can also create those game plans in microcosms like Mm -hmm. in your communities and you know just like me and the moms talking about doing an educational town hall Uh uh-oh my battery's going low oh shoot (laughs) let me take somebody give my bring bring my charger in here bring my charger i know um but yeah, that, with, you know. With that, I think uh, me and Megan were talking. We do want to put uh, in the description of this video, you know, places people can donate to, people um, that you can follow. Um, because I, the other day, was follow. I follow most of the leaders um, mm-hmm. that are organizing some of these protests. And I'm watching on my phone and they have a mission. They have their action items. They have yep. their chance. They know why they're going out there. And then, yep. you know, you turn on the news and they're just showing the looting. They, they, I swear they were on the van store for like four hours. I'm like, who cares? <laughs> like move right. on, you right. know, but there are people there out here, like with good intentions, they have a direction. And I think it's important for us to, to follow those people and to like really see, you know, what, yeah. what we can do. I think John Legend posts another, um, like a week of action and it's mm-hmm. another organization um, that every day is a different, is a different goal. You know, every single day is a different goal. And so we have to, you know, start unfollowing some of those people that aren't supporting you and go look up some new people that you can actually find a to-do list. Right. You know, to get out there. There's a ton of organizations that have been doing the grassroots work. Yeah. And thankfully, because there's a lot of white guilt, (laughs) so a lot of people are like, 
flushing donations, which is great. Amazing. Cause we need them and it's going to be a long fight and we don't know yeah. how long these protests are going to go on. You know, we have charges, we don't have convictions. Yeah. Um, and then we, that's, that's one case. We still got beyond it. Like we need foot on next for everybody. And yep. this is, yeah. we're just, this is specific to police brutality. There's so many other areas that need to be addressed. And as, again, Budgets, like yeah, budget. that's nothing. Yeah. Defund the police. I don't know that I think about. I don't know. A lot of people, especially on the far left, and a lot of the the, the white allies, like to say defund or no, I'm sorry, abolish the police. Um, mm. which I don't, <laughs> like, that's interesting, and I've been yeah. thinking about how what what the answer to that is is community policing, community policing, and funding. Funding, giving opportunity right. to at-risk youth and to adults, right? Um, but it's a long journey. We got a long way to yeah. go as far as yeah. restorative justice is concerned. But definitely, I love that you guys are going to be listing the organizations that can be currently supported. Can I be ghetto real quick? Because my husband go ahead. Is awesome. <laughs> but I'm going to stay on, but you guys are going to mini. I could grab my charger because. See, this oh. is my love. This is a real mommy right. moment. <laughs> real Somebody answer my test. Where are y'all at? Come and give me this charger. Oh. <laughs> He's ignoring me. Okay. You mean your debut, got, girl? Got, got it. But the content's so real. That's all that matters. No, that's, that's all it. that matters. <laughs> we gave up trying right. to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, and, I, does, and I think that's does. why. I, also, I think that's why um, one of our followers was like, you guys are really just yourselves on here. I'm like, look, there's kids in the background yelling, stuff going on. This is real mommy life. This yeah. is real mommy Yeah. Um, I want to ask you this, Mia, about... Um, I have a black son. You have a 12 year old black son. You have a five year old black son. I saw one of your posts um, about how when the whole Trayvon Martin situation happened, you had to have the talk with mm-hmm. your son who's now 12. Now that this has happened, you've had to have the talk again with your five year old son. What is that talk? What do you say to your children? <sighs> um. So... Trayvon Martin happened in 2012. Devin Mm -hmm. was five. We were living in Lake Oswego, Portland. Again, another white suburban neighborhood. Um, Maybe one or two children of color, of color, not black, of color that we went to school with at the time. And um, I used to listen to CNN all the time, like in the car. And so as things were breaking and stories are breaking, he was just initially just hearing the information. And um, I can't remember exactly how I started the dialogue, um, but I just remember being like, you can't sugarcoat this because this is life or death, right? And um, I I think that's one thing that I've, a way that I've always been with my kids is very blunt and sometimes maybe a little um, too aggressive isn't the word, but blunt, I guess blunt is the word. Um, And because I'm not a child psychologist, because I just, I know that how I work and I need to know the facts. Like, I don't want you to sugarcoat anything. Like I want to know so that I can assess that and then come up with how I'm going to respond to it. Um, And so with Devin, He, you know, I just said, look, (laughs) America has a long, horrible history with their relationship with Black people in the Black community and people that look like you and um, and daddy and granny and uncle. You know, I'm just going off. And um, I was like, there's no real... um, it's hard to explain to you because it doesn't make sense. (laughs) Like when you try to reason with it, like it it really doesn't make sense. And it, and it really, it is a complicated conversation because it really is about um, the need for inferiority in order for white supremacy to exist. 
Um, and that's just a complex conversation for a five-year-old. So, yeah. you know, I just had to give the basics. Like people are fearful because of the, the media portrayal, because of, um, you know, um, I think I just start talking to him about like growing up in the hood and just like how it is and, you know, why things are the way they are and the hopelessness and, you know, with gang banging, why dudes gang bang? Cause they, they, that's where they find community and, you yeah. know, that's where they find opportunities with the streets and, you know, how that leads to territorial wars. And like, I really just walked him through kind of growing up as an LA kid in her city. And I remember him being like, mom, I'm not going to the hood till I'm 50. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny about that. <laughs> Terrell is from South Central Watts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and before like the riots broke out, he was like play by play telling me what was about to go down. And I was just looking at him like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And literally verbatim, it went down the way he said it. And yeah, are you talking about like with, with the, the protests and stuff happening now? With the looting, with the rioting, basically oh, yeah. in L.A., with the L.A., with L.A., because he lived through the L.A. riots, <laughs> yes. you know, and he was like, watch tomorrow. Watch this. Like, and I'm like, how do you. But it's it's a real thing. <laughs> right. He just, right. So. Um, At least this time they didn't go to their own community. They was like Beverly Hills. Here we come. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What's so crazy about the LA riots is that, um, and I, I look just like my mom. So imagine this <laughs> me driving little Mia. Um, and she was on, cause she, she was a, a nurse, a home health nurse. So I was on like her little route and we were on, um, Crenshaw and Normandy. And, you know, the epicenter was Florence and Normandy when it started going down. So as the news is breaking that these cops were being acquitted, the shit, excuse me, starts going down. And I remember, because we're so fair skinned, they threw a bottle at my mom's car and it like hit the windshield. She's like, get out, Mia. So like, I just remember it like, oh shit, it's going down. <laughs> like for me, it just was so surreal. And then we lived in Ladera at the time. So we, she's smashing back to Ladera <laughs> in the house for like four days. And I saw our community burn. I was like, this is crazy. And they didn't even come to Ladera, but like La Brea, yeah. um, Rodeo now, which is Obama Boulevard, burned all that down. Like, so I, I actually, I feel like, yeah, take, yes, go to where the, com where it needs to be uncomfortable. Like, and yeah. it's, it's sad. I got friends that live in Beverly Hills that I had to like be silent with for a few days because I would see them be like, this is terrible. It's like, no, well, you know, what's real terrible is when you're executed without judge and jury by the police. Like that's terrible. Yeah. All yeah. these buildings, glad it's insurance. Like this will be replaced. Yeah. Life can never be replaced. And until America recognizes Black life is valuable, we're going to keep having the same problem. So what y'all want to do? <laughs> yeah. And I, you know what? what when you say that, I, I just, I saw this post from a journalist who was, who's been really, really critical of Colin Kaepernick um, mm -hmm. since he started his whole kneeling. Mm -hmm. And he, all, he, he wrote this long apology and was like, I am oh, so wow. sorry, Colin. Maybe if we had listened to you when you started kneeling, like we wouldn't be where we are. Because this is the same thing you were talking about. He said, so for all the articles that I wrote, for all the horrible things that I've said about you, I apologize. And I was like, yo, that is so necessary. And I feel like if if that is what the outcome is of this protesting, this looting, if we have more people that are just like, yo, I see what you're saying. That to me is the beginning of, of all of this changing, you know, to where, you know, when my son gets of age, I, I don't, my goal and my prayer is that one day I will never have to tell him how he has to behave because it's safe for him. You know what I'm saying? Like that is a big goal that I don't have to go, you know, these are the rights that I know your, your white friends don't have to worry about this, but you do like I, my prayer is that one day it's so safe for him. I don't even have to say that to him because that's not even a real fear that is gone and done with, you know, and until that becomes a reality, it's my responsibility as a mother to keep <laughs> fighting for our world to look like that. You know, maybe we won't see it in this lifetime, but if I do my part, hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. Yeah. When you, when you told Dash, Dash is five, right? Mm -hmm. um, because what I think about, I think about my two-year-old and how innocent she is and how loving she is and everyone who comes to the door, I love you. Like, you know, and, and 
I fear that talk because it's almost like ripping away this imagination yeah. that they have so young, you yeah. know? And so how did he, he take it this time around? Um, so, and Devin is my scary son. I need to stop <laughs> speaking that over him. <laughs> he's like my little giant. He don't want no smoke. He's, right, just, right. he's like the jokester. He's just trying Aww. to play basketball. Like he don't want too much drama. Dash wants all the smoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so I was surprised at his reaction when I had the conversation. I posted a, a yeah. It on social media and saying that, um, you know, there and besides cops, people, it's not just only the cop, people yeah. in general. That's mm-hmm. why the cops get called. People in, are fearful of you because of your skin color and because of your features. And, you know, um, so this is all happening because cops don't have the same respect for you as they would, you know, another person that doesn't look like you or doesn't have your skin tone. And I was like, but you're not going to have to worry about that because when you, if you have a a confrontation or, you know, with the cops, you're going to respect yourself and you're going to know how to handle the situation and you're going to be okay. And he was like, but mom, what if they hit me and I cry? You know, because I think I told him like you're. I told him like you're respectable Ugh. and you're strong, which is I shouldn't have to tell a five year old that you have yeah. to be strong to encounter the goddamn police. Like that's just crazy. Right. Um, but it's real, and I, I didn't want him to be fearful of the police. And so, you know, when he said that, and this is coming from Dash that wants all the smoke, I was just <laughs> like as much as I wanted to lean into his pain in that moment and his fear in that moment, I had, you know, I wanted to redirect that. And I was like, you're not going to cry because you're strong and you're respectable and you're going to handle the situation. If you got to sue somebody and sue Like I just went there and I was like, <laughs> I have to do that. But, you know, I think that our inherent things as mothers is we were trying to protect life. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And um, it's been really interesting to see all of these allies coming out to these protests. Um, I was at one yesterday in Oakland, Lake Merritt, that um, Juan Anderson put on from the Warriors. And he started off the protest with everyone laying down, and I've seen this before, everyone laying down, handcuffed position, face on the ground, which is uncomfortable, even when you ain't got nobody on you, but in the pressure of a cop situation, I can only imagine what that feels like. Um, And, you know, you heard people, it was like a moment of silence type of thing for the eight minutes, 46 seconds. And you had people that were kind of saying the things that George was saying. And um, Mm -hmm. I had a friend who brought her friend, who's a white woman with a mixed child. And she was like, that's my son, like crying, like just everybody, you know, you could hear the sobs. And I think that that is how humans connect is you have to like the pain of something, you know what I mean? Or the emotion of something. And so that was a really transformative moment. I'm sure for that woman, for, you know, any other white people that were there, like. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. It's okay. A lawless land in this household. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. It's Girl, okay. All the boys, trust me. Uh, the moms that are listening to this are like, "What? Well, I got the same thing going on, girl." Right. Yeah, no. yeah. Um, but for any humans, even when we're watching movies, like we connect to emotion, yeah. right? And so, um, and to, to real authentic stories, and I think even with the media and, and TV shows and movies that are out, we've only shown white people slave life in. Yeah. Funny Medea and you know what I mean, blackish, like mm. Cosby's, like we haven't really been able to show all of our stories, or they've never been put to a mainstream culture, you know? So I think for the media side, entertainment side, there's a real responsibility to um to have blackness displayed in all of its glory and in, in, in all of our stories and in, in Oh my God. I think connecting emotionally is how we can also turn on some light bulbs too. Yeah. Oh girl, this is heavy. I like just hearing you talk. It just, 
I can't cry. I've cried enough. I know. I'm like sitting here like. <laughs> We're not, I'm not going to cry. Um, so let's move on a little bit. Um, let's talk about self-care because I feel like we've spent the last weeks just, you know, dealing with seeing people die and seeing people protesting people die get hurt. You know what I mean? Like, it's insane. Yeah. So so seeing all of that, what does self-care look like for you? What are some things that we should be thinking about to make sure we stay well mentally while we deal with this? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, the past two weeks, I've been so like engulfed in social media and what's going on and, and feeling like like I have to stay connected and you know I'm signing every petition and I'm you yeah. know I'm telling people where to donate and I'm giving book recommendations like I have not been practicing self-care um I'm hoping to allow myself that space in this upcoming week um but for me and in you know my times of distress throughout my life and my adult life, I read, oh, I'm su- such a reader, <laughs> like, yeah. and like a brainiac nerdy reader, like stuff that, you know, books on astrophysics and like, I like to escape in knowledge. So I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, so for me, that's self-care, educating myself through reading, um, um, meditating, meditating. And it's something that I go, I do it in spurts. Like I'll go maybe a month and a half or so of like daily meditation and, and making it a part of a routine. Quarantine kind of just threw me all off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody off. Right, but, right, right. Um, I encourage people who are, who are struggling with um, either identity or um, purpose. Um, I think the first thing is just learning yourself um and going within and these are all things that sound great but you're like okay well what does that mean <laughs> and, yeah. and again for me I gotta hop in my nerd bag and I've, I've read books on Buddhism and um meditation and in the purpose and the practice um and I found real solace in that so definitely that's self-care and then especially in quarantine times, like I ain't put on makeup. I put on a little something today, but I, I got my hair cut. Like you like then it's the physical things, like yeah. you know, getting that massage, um, just doing the things for self that I think for moms we feel guilty about, whether it's budget reasons or timing, time management, we don't set aside enough time like yeah. think about the hours that we put into our family versus what in work and then ourselves like we yeah. always come last mm-hmm. and you can't pour from an in- empty cup I know that's a phrase that a lot of people use but it is true like you have to nurture yourself um and whatever your self-care looks like and you know hopefully stay away from vice type of things i have my own vices <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know try to try to identify what self-care looks like outside of the wine down or the <laughs> Yo, somebody <laughs> sent us nine bottles of champagne i have well, no idea <laughs> i have no idea where they came from i was like oh i thought you bought it it's like oh almond gosh. champagne i was like that. what I have I, I campaign. Yeah, I sent you one. I was like, who sent these? It's like a huge box. What if it's your white neighbor who feels guilty and was like, I'm I don't have white. That. I don't think I have those. I <laughs> know. Oh, somebody lurking in the gentrification. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, that's good. I think this, it was crazy this week for the next week. I gave up drinking wine mm. for the next six weeks just because I knew my mind needed to be reset it a little bit yeah. mm-hmm. um because there's no telling if I was sipping something and what I would say to somebody right now <laughs> no so I'm serious yeah. no, it's um real. so I told myself the next six weeks I just gotta lay it off and just focus <laughs> on like like whole foods and you know make it make it because we've been uh eating out a lot I'm just like gonna make everything and just yes. nutrition enter back to myself <laughs> That's a big one too, is nutrition. nutrition. That's yeah. something that I um, actually did a live with Simply Wholesome family. Oh, I was on that. Um, and educating yourself on what is really beneficial for your body. I think culturally, 
even as a Creole, our diets are horrible. Like yeah. our roux and oil-based things and, um, you know, it's delicious as hell. But mm. like, we have to also just start being accountable for the things that we're putting in our body. And I know a lot of it has to do with um, the ability to purchase fresh foods and produce and there's food deserts. But when there's a will, there's a way. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can start your mini garden. You can um, make the choice to invest in your health, you know, and in that 70 to $100 that even in the hood, you're going to spend on fast food over a course of a couple of weeks, like really invest in, you know, um, what's what you're able to do but also like your herbs, like just learn and research mm-hmm. the things that our bodies need specific to African Caribbean, you know, like what works for our systems is not the same as European. So yeah. things like that. You did motivate me. I did make a big investment. It's Which coming on Saturday, the Peloton. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I be looking at your stories. It's taken me a month to receive this thing. I have been preparing. It comes on Saturday. Yes. Life. <laughs> and, and, and like, okay, so the Peloton, that's a very, we're very privileged to be able to purchase the Peloton. Don't call, don't right? say it, Megan. It, I mean, you are. Okay. But I'll <laughs> Megan has a, Megan has a term for me. What is it? Oh, it's crunchy, girl. Crunchy, you granola. Well, I'm hella granola. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> hella granola. But like, Okay, so if you can't get the Peloton, you could get them shoes on and go running. Like, mm-hmm. there's are you into the live workouts? Like, when there's a will, there's a way. We have to start being accountable where we are for how we take care of ourselves and how we take care of our families. Like, it's just we got to start being accountable. There you Aww. go. All right, Black Dad has entered to take the baby. Black Dad. <laughs> yes, Black Father. Sweating. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so Mia, I have to talk to you about this. So, like, I am a big 90s R&B. Oh, my God. (laughs) That is, like, I don't really know new songs because all of my songs consist of the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. So, back in the day, I heard this song called Monica. And I was like, I love this song. Monica, Monica, Monica. (laughs) Like, it was just the jam. And then as I'm doing this research... I find, I I am reminded that that group was that trio was called Before Dark, and Mia Wright was one of the people <laughs> in Before Dark. Shut your mouth! I was like, that was shut mouth. your mouth! That was my jam, and I didn't I didn't even real I didn't even make the connection. And then when I saw it, I was like, I love that song. <laughs> so like, you are definitely a Renaissance woman, a, a Jane of all trades. Okay. Right. You're free. You sing, you activist, everything. Um, is there any plans for you to sing? Are you guys doing a reunion? Like, what's up with y'all? That's so funny. No, bless everyone's <laughs> hearts. Because we, it's what's crazy. Like, we have somebody set up a Spotify. Like, folks, wow. their little before dark moment here and there. I love it. I love it. Um, no, but there is, you will see like a little uh, cameo of us um, in some upcoming Omarion projects, like just like on camera, us together again, which is so fun. But we actually, um, th- those are my best friends, Jenny and Arika are sisters. So we've always mm. stayed close and connected in like family. Jenny is actually the senior executive producer of Grownish. Um, oh. I have a whole story about Jenny. It's hilarious. So, I, you know, I've been in the hosting space for a while and I used to host after shows, one of them being for the game. Yep. Where she, right, she was a writer on the game, right? Yep. And I used to say the, whatever, okay? Like if the show, if the episode was good, if it was bad, <laughs> who named this episode? Why did they do this, right? Because I didn't think anybody watched my right. weekend. Right. I was like, nobody's watching this. And then my agent hits me one day and was like, hey, you want to be on the game? They just hit me up. And I was like, what? Like a game show? He was like, no, no, no. The game, the Uh show. I was like, shut up. He's like, yeah, they've been watching your your recaps. I was like, wait, what? Like, what have I been saying? Ah. (laughs) So then I go on set to do and they had me do the funniest role. It was a reporter. It was like a really small role as a a reporter on the game. Mm -hmm. And um. 
when I got there, Jenny was, she was her and another writer. Mm -hmm. They both were just like, we just want to let you know, like, we be watching your recap, like, every week. Oh, wow. (laughs) Like, oh, I said, I'm so sorry, because I don't know. (laughs) I'm going to be a little more careful. They were like, no, we love it, because that let us, like, know an authentic perspective. Feedback, yeah. Of the episode. And I was like, okay. So, yes. Hey, girl. Hey, Jenny. (laughs) Like it is a small world out here, it's I tell you. Small world. And then Enrique went on to like tour with Usher and Chris Brown dancing because that's oh wow. Fashion. Um, and wardrobe and like costume design. So she works on Blackish as like the ward lead wardrobe or um, costume girl. I don't know the appropriate term, but yeah. So it's we're all still very much connected. I actually like I'm aspiring. I don't know that screenwriting is my lane, but definitely like executive producing, creative development of shows. Mm. Y'all started in TV, actually. Y'all started in with commercials and print and all that. Um, so I'm I'm working on a project uh, that Jenny, we're hoping to bring her in and involve her in on. Uh, but that's so funny. You kind of look like Tay. You know that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. I get that all the time. All the time. <laughs> I've had yeah. a lot of people say Right, yeah, right. All the black and Asians, all of us Korean and blacks look the same. So okay. <laughs> it's repeated. Yeah. Yeah. The small world no before dark reunion that we know of. <laughs> okay, well, I guess I'll just have to continue to listen to y'all on my spot. Monica, Monica, Monica. That's my jam. Um, definitely I want to circle back into the entertainment space. That's where I grew up. And that's what I know. And um that's my happy place. So yeah. yeah. Definitely come back more on the executive producer side, though. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, but before we get out of here, where can do you have anything that's upcoming that we can find out more information about? Um, where can people hit you up on social media? All that good stuff. Right. So, um, two things um, that I have in play all the time is uh, Right Legacy Foundation, which is my family's nonprofit. Um, we already had the deadline and we'll be announcing our 2020 uh, scholarship recipients, but for California graduating high school seniors for next mm-hmm. year, I think our application um, opens February 1st to April 1st, um, where we give partial scholarships for California students specifically. Um, and of course, we're always looking for our inner city kids um, to award. So that's one. And then with the National Basketball Wise Association, um, we are in a, in a pivoting situation as well because we're used to doing like physical events for fundraising. Um, but we want to um, kind of open up some sort of educational forum for kids, um, especially as it relates to mental health with all of this happening. Um, uh-huh. and, and bringing on, you know, a licensed therapist, child therapist to like discuss and just have like a, a open format, have kids ask questions and providing those resources to kids that would, won't otherwise have them. Um, we just did a uh, campaign with First Book where we were able to donate um, three books to 5,000 kids like across oh, wow. the country. Um, so I'm always doing something with MVWA. We're always launching some sort of new, you know, campaign initiative that we're fundraising for. So definitely look out and follow MVWA social, which is at MVWA SSOC. Um, and then my personal at Mrs. Mia Wright. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's just in such a, Quite like every time I think like, oh, okay, here's what's about to happen next. Nope. <laughs> Girl, it's day by day. And for everybody, like you almost have to be so present, which is interesting because we're most times not like, yeah. so it's a good thing, um, but it's a very new space for a lot of people to really sit with yourself and like mm. sit with purpose. And like, what does that really look like? It's, it's no, it's not really the rat race, you know, so much anymore. Like it's, people are really combing through a lot of the fluff and being like, okay, what am I doing here and why? And, yeah. and let me figure, let me figure that out while there's like some downtime. So, yeah. yeah. <sighs> this was great. <laughs> uh, before we get out of here, we always want to leave you with some inspiration uh, for you to remember that you are okay, both mentally and physically. Uh, today, I think Megan has a quote. I do. Um, 
So this quote was by Marion, the singer Marion Anderson. Um, she said, no matter how big a nation is, it is no stronger than its weakest people. And as mm-hmm. long as you keep a person down, some part of you has to be down there to hold them down. So it means you cannot soar as you might otherwise. And that, you know, when I was looking for like inspiration for this week, that was really big because I'm like, yo, first of all, Marian Anderson was dealing with racism back in like 1930s, 1940s. You know, they wouldn't even let her sing in the biggest auditorium because she was black. So they had to move it to the National Mall only to have it 75,000 strong come to hear her sing. So, you know, the problems that she faced, we're still facing. And so, you know, it's really important to say, no, yeah, we're when you think about the the minorities in this country yeah we in in one mindset we might be the weakest not necessarily you know in our heads but it weakest economically and and in other ways but we've been held down <laughs> by certain people so if you're going to hold us down that means you holding yourself back too cuz you got to put energy towards holding me down you know, mm. it's like, oh my gosh, if we just change the thinking and go, hey, I can't oppress you no more. I don't have time to be putting my knee on your neck because that means I got to be down here too. Okay. I got a bad back. I can't be down here on the ground. <laughs> like you need to like, like stop doing that because a part of you has to be down here too. So put energy towards uplifting so that you can uplift yourself, you know? Mm. So that was just really big. And I just wanted to think, have us concentrate on that this week, especially if you're not a person in our community, but maybe you're an ally, like think about that. Talk to the other people around you that maybe look like you and maybe have a different mindset of trying to keep people down. Share that quote with them. Marian Anderson. <laughs> that was great. All right, you guys, um, we're going to get out of here. We thank you for sticking around for this special episode of Mommy Needs a Break. Uh, you can definitely follow our uh, podcast at MNAB Podcast everywhere on social media. Also hit up our website, uh, mnabpodcast.com. And you can find me, Megan Thomas, at Meg Scoop everywhere. And me, Marisa Johnson, at she is Marisa J. <laughs> oh, and our Patreon, support us, support Black News. Yeah. Follow us, even if it's like $1 a month, or if you just want to give us a one-time donation, whatever it is, hit us up, uh, patreon.com forward slash MNAB podcast. And all of those links are below or in, uh, or attached, <laughs> depending on where you're watching this. We thank you guys so much. And Mia, where can we find you before we get out of here? Any final words? Um, at Mrs. Mia Wright is my uh, IG, um, our Foundation website is rightlegacyfdn.org. NBWA is, is nbwassoc.org. I'm on Twitter at Mio underscore Mayo. And last words um, are to um, don't put limitations on yourself. Um, I think as moms, I think as women, women of color, black women, um, we we're kind of forced we're already categorized right and so I think that this is a awakening of spirits of ancestors telling us like nope nope (laughs) so yeah no more so just (laughs) don't put any limitations on yourself dream big and you know conceive it believe it achieve it love it thank you guys so much for taking a break with us right here on mommy needs a break we'll see you next week